and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Welcome aboard the Financial Independence Podcast. G'day, and welcome to another episode of Captain Fire, the Financial Independence Podcast, where I open the cockpit to some of the best and brightest in personal finance, as well as those who have reached or are on their way to financial independence. Before we get started, remember, nothing said here is financial advice, and you should always do your own independent research before making any financial choices. With that being said, I hope you enjoy the episode and learn something new. This podcast is brought to you by the best portfolio tracking tool for Aussie investors. ShareSite makes it incredibly simple to track your portfolio with automatic updates of share purchases and dividends, easy to read graphs, and comprehensive tax and performance reporting, all wrapped up in an easy to use cloud-based system. For users with fewer than 10 holdings, it is completely free, and I even used the free version for years. Head over to captainfire.com forward slash ShareSite dash review to see if ShareSite is for you. Captain Fire listeners can score themselves four months of ShareSite Premium for free by using the bonus signup code in the article. If you do ever decide to hold more than 10 stocks, be sure to use this code to get your first four months for free. Even if you do only plan to use the free version, using the code means if you ever do upgrade, you'll still get your four months for free. Ditch the Excel spreadsheet and complete your tax with a click of a button by signing up today. That's captainfire.com forward slash ShareSite dash review for your four free months. All right, so a lot has changed from when I first spoke to Kurt Walcom, who was one of the three co-founders of Perla. We talked a bit about the platform. And for those that don't know, Perla is an online brokerage platform, which is built specifically for the financial independence community. It's got some great features, most notably the auto invest function, where you can set up some basic ongoing rules, and then it just does it for you on autopilot. So they also have a bunch of online tools, information, calculators, as well as some of the most competitive brokerage rates and fees for an Australian broker. So I recorded the first pod with Kurt not long after Perla had actually launched and wanting to know a bit more about it, I actually ended up meeting with him. And so Tash and I, we went out, took a Cessna up, had a bit of a fly around Sydney Harbour and then headed out for dinner and drinks. I don't think I have ever spoken so much about financial independence and investing over dinner. And I probably learned more than anyone ever needs to know about brokerage platforms, but it was pretty reassuring and I was happy to switch over to Perla. So one of the main reasons I switched was the ability to set investing rules for dollar cost averaging, and then basically just let autopilot do its things. Previously, I had let things like media and market movements negatively influence my own investing decisions. And I didn't even stick to my investing plans. Right? I thought I was a great investor, but I couldn't even stick to my plans. Things like holding off over trivial corrections and clickbait headlines. Anyway, now that I've got AutoInvest configured, I don't really have to worry so much about the whole behavioral or emotional aspect of investing. So it's a bit of a game changer. And it's something I've extensively used in my aviation career to improve safety and performance. Now, the team behind Perla is not just Kurt. One of the, one of the hardworking people behind the scenes of Perla is Nick. So he's one of the original three co-founders and CEO of Perla. So I've been chatting to Nick since pretty much day one of creating a Perla account. And he's always been really helpful and insightful whenever I've contacted them for support. Obviously, it was a bit of a lean startup. The three co-founders, Nick, Kurt, and Hayden, basically filling all three roles, filling all of the roles together. So in the early days, I think I'd call up with a technical support question or a customer support question. I'm pretty sure it would go to his mobile phone. <laughs> but flash forward to today, and they've got over 50,000 active users the team's obviously expanded a bit to support this growing user base and they're now dedicated teams. So when you call customer support, I don't think it goes to Nick's mobile phone anymore. But anyway, look, I'm really excited to find out how it's all been tracking, what the new features are from Perla and what's on the near horizon for the Captain Fire blog. I also just want to reiterate that whilst I'm interested in it from the perspective of the blog, from a user's perspective, I haven't really paid much attention to it all. And I've just let AutoInvest do its thing. Right. So this morning I've got Nick. So g'day, Nick. Welcome to the show. How are you going, mate? 
Good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the intro. Yeah, no dramas, man. Obviously, I know you're into surfing, so we've spoken about that before, but can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Apart from my day-to-night job of working on Perla, I have a very active and vibrant young family, so I've got three kids under six, and that's a large part of my existence at the moment, and I love it, obviously. So my wife, Kate, and I are very hands-on and full-on in that capacity. You mentioned surfing, and maybe I don't get as much time to do things like that at the moment, but I think I see a light at the end of the tunnel, and that's a function of maybe a, a youngest son nearing two, and also maybe on the Perla front being able to build out a bit more of a corporate and marketing team. For the moment, I'm part Perla, part dad, and that'll evolve back to some balance in the future, hopefully. Oh, three kids. I didn't realize you had three young ones, mate. I just thought you had the one, but that must keep you very busy between the Perla staff and having a young family. Yeah, it's good. But uh, luckily, they're fairly interested in some things that we that I like doing. If we're not at the beach, we're probably mucking around on the skateboard on the balcony or something like that. I do get to find ways to make it a bit of me time as well. But yeah, certainly it's a full lot at the moment. Yeah, there's a lot of exciting things going on for Perla. I think since Kurt and I first had a chat, there's been a bunch of new features like US share trading and all that. What's been going on and what's on the cards for Perla's near future? So I think when we're chatting about this today, we're just on a year of being live out of beta. And so some of the big things that have obviously happened in the year, we launched with a really simple platform, right? We launched with Aussie Trading, Auto Invest, and some social proof kind of triggers and calculators and whatnot. And since then, we've done US, we've added instant funding, we've launched an app, we've created the net wealth dashboard that allows you to link in your bank accounts. And I think they're the big ones, but there's been many iterations based on customer feedback. And so it's almost at the point now where even for myself, I'm a bit like you, I try not to spend too much time in the platform and probably check in every six weeks or so, just so I keep my mind fresh. But a lot's going on. And I think the big things though are what's been happening behind the scenes that are yet to launch. We're in the process of launching Micro, which is basically the Perla experience just boiled down into a managed investment scheme. So a really simple trust fund that people can invest in largely the same popular ETFs of the community. They can just do it now in dollars and cents. So that's been a long time coming and we're really excited and happy to get that out there. It's been really well received so far. Then in addition to that, we've been working on a couple of things. So we're almost there on our little superannuation marketplace. The idea behind that is making it super easy for people to, one, monitor their super alongside their shares, but two, find a retail super fund, low cost, that sort of aligns to their values and will help them roll over their super in the platform. That's a key part of what we've been trying to move towards. So I think with Micro and with the super marketplace, all of a sudden we will be this share trading platform that has managed funds and superannuation, all of which are external products, right? They're not Perla products. They are... ETFs managed by managers. They are the micro fund of ETFs and they're the super fund of other retail super funds. So it's sending us in that direction away from just being this sort of one dimensional share trading platform to this wealth management platform. And that was always where we thought we wanted to go. It's really exciting to be actually now stepping in that direction. Yeah, it's cool. Actually, super, it doesn't really get a great rap in the whole FIRE community, but it is an important part of everyone's financial independence journey because unless you plan to die young, like you're going to eventually breach preservation age. And if you can focus on the super, it means you don't necessarily need as much in your conventional brokerage. And there's a bunch of awesome tools out there that people can use to, to do those calculators. And Aussie Firebug's got one that you can use on his website as well. So that's going to be cool because that's something that I've found particularly there's not a lot of great information about picking the best super platform you know comparing things like fees and what's actually inside like the actual underlying investments sometimes it can be really confusing yeah i'm keen to see how that eventuates i think the thing for us was is it's part of choosing funds right but it's also probably more from perla's perspective helping people be really conscious of what they're doing but we're more interested in the behavioral element of So you're investing, you're confidently investing. Are you as confident or are you as on top of your super as you are with your investing? If not, why not? Have you considered 
whether you want to be doing additional contributions or not and and why have you considered where the money's going and it's more about just bringing those two worlds closer together and i think one of the challenges of the whole finance industry is those two worlds have been so separate and when they're separate and with super in the back of your mind by default you're not as on top of it not that it's on the scale of good or bad but you might not be doing it as well as you'd like to so that's just the start of the process for us rather than some kind of mega business aspiration and look, I actually just recently rolled my super over into just one fund. I didn't give it the respect it really deserved. I just went, oh, here's a good place that I can park a bunch of money in index funds. But I hadn't really carefully considered the effect of paying multiple fees. And I wasn't getting any insurance where I had it. So it was an easy decision once I'd done a bit more reading about it to roll it over just into a single fund. So yeah, I think having an awareness of your super is important to your Bang on the money there. Now, so Perla Micro. So I had a bit of a play around with this recently. I wanted to do a bit of a review content for the blog. I thought it was great fun. But I did have a question, which was, can we roll over or can we transfer like our Perla Micro balances to just like our regular Perla accounts? Is that a thing that you can do? It's a really good question. And it's a really important topic that's on our agenda at the moment is to how to join those two worlds a bit better. But the answer is, yes, you can, but it's going to have tax implications or it's likely to have tax implications. And the reason for that is it's not currently possible to do a version of a transfer or in-species transfer or distribution from a managed investment scheme onto your own hint. So what we're thinking about in this space is, okay, how do we create micro as a accumulator style asset for people, whereby if someone needs to take two, three, four months to get, say, $1,000 together, how do we help them do that in the market, in the assets they want to invest in? And then how do we help them seamlessly move that across into their own name where it doesn't attract ongoing subscription fees, et cetera? And you There are two parts to that. One is their personal circumstance and the potential tax implications I mentioned before. And the other is obviously the cost. So let's just say we're looking at the subscription cost that it might take someone to accumulate that money. And we're thinking of ways to offset the cost of then moving it across into brokerage, which is obviously we don't want people being double charged. But we haven't yet figured out a way to do it, but it's certainly something we're trying to figure out. I think like Perla Micro and micro investing accounts in general seem to be like a great education tool with sort of a much lower entry barrier. People can get some skin in the game. And then I guess it is just like a natural progression from micro investing through to investing in your own hin. So it's great to know that's on the cards. Now the elephant in the room. All right. So when I switched to Perla, you guys had, I'm pretty sure you guys had the best brokerage or the lowest brokerage in Australia. Now I think brokerage does get a disproportionate amount of attention when it comes to investing headlines. And I'm probably guilty of fixating on this a bit much as well. And I would probably just say that investor behavior, like asset allocation, structuring, that's probably what really changes the needle. And obviously how much you can invest rather than just trying to incessantly find the cheapest brokerage. Nonetheless, it is good to see brokerage across the board dropping on all Australian platforms. And it's been dubbed the race to the bottom, which is what happened in America. So I'm keen to hear what Perla is doing in response to this race to the bottom and other platforms like Stake, which are going $3 and then flying brokerage all the way down to, to free brokerage at the moment. Yeah, I think no one's going to argue with trying to make things cheaper. And when we think about Perla and trying to incentivize, good behavior is investing more regularly, investing for less, and then holding long term. So anything we can do to make that process smoother, we're obviously trying to do. And so there's a few elements though, right? It's if you're not making money off one product, what product are you making money off? both from a business perspective and also from a consumer like transparency perspective. And so I'll come back to that, but transparency and simplicity is really important, I think, for any business and people knowing where money is being made off them is really important. It also ties into to grow a business and become a business that is valuable and help a lot of people. You need to actually make some revenue somewhere, whether the cost is zero for one product Rest assured, there's someone making money somewhere, right? And that's a perfect example is in the States where 
it might be zero brokerage, but all they've really done is shift the brokerage to another part of the value chain where there's no minimums. And that's fine because over time they became more transparent about that. But will there be an equivalent of that in Australia? I guess we'll see. Perhaps we're not set up for that just yet. So when we look at actually what's happening and what Pearl is doing, right now we're at $9.50, which for a while was in the middle there at a reasonably cheap price. And yes, the market's moved. I think late last year, there was a few moments of truth for us in terms of what would happen. So a couple of the players in the market went altogether free for a shorter period of time, right? October through to December, there were lots of promotions happening, which is great for consumers, gets a lot more people in, interested, and it creates a lot of buzz. And for us, at a critical time in our journey, where we were looking to make sure we could prove to financial backers that we had a sustainable business, we didn't have much choice, right? We couldn't just turn our pricing off. And also, we couldn't combat any of that with marketing because we don't really spend money on marketing yet. So we had to sit there and see what happened. And we've come through that period and we've continued to grow, which has given us a lot of confidence that what we're building has some value to people. People are willing to pay us something for what we're doing. And we told people at the time, I think late last year, that we were going to work on a few things. We were going to work on getting prices cheaper, uh, smaller minimums, and Perla Micro, which is now launched, obviously. And where we're at today, we're actually just about to announce new pricing. So we were $9.50. We're going to announce very shortly that the pricing is going to be $6.50. And if you prepay with Perla Credit, you can get the price to $5.50. So it's not free, but I don't think anything's free. And I think it's not as cheap as some of the others in the market, but hopefully it shows to our customers and investors first and foremost that are with us today, that we're listening and we're trying our best. And hopefully it shows that there's actually a viable alternative out there to ultimately pricing that is funded by marketing. So just to summarize, we're trying I think we've got some pricing that we're about to launch that's going to be competitive, but not the cheapest. And I think once that pricing gets down to that couple of bucks and you're not talking huge differences, it's really up to people to decide what business they want to put their money with and why and what platform helps them the most. And it's not going to be Perler in every instance. And we just have to be comfortable with that. That's awesome. I think that's pretty reasonable brokerage and at the end of the day we're not really trading every day most of us in the community are either making fortnightly monthly it isn't a huge drain but it's awesome to hear that the prices are coming down do you have a side hustle my side hustle is websites a form of digital real estate if you want to learn more about this lucrative side hustle check out my review of the e-business institute and their online self-paced courses they cover everything from total beginners right through to advanced web design and how to buy renovate and sell websites for profit as a graduate of Matt and Liz's courses, I can't thank them enough for the valuable web skills they gave me, and now I enjoy growing my portfolio of websites for income. Captain Fly listeners can register for free access to some of these courses by signing up using the link at www.captainfy.com forward slash ebusiness institute dash review. Build your portfolio of digital real estate and start using websites to make money today. You touched on where you're not paying brokerage, but you're paying that somewhere else. And the first thing that come to my mind was, okay, so you're not paying brokerage on international trades, but for most platforms, you are getting tracked with a Forex fee, which can be significant. So you also mentioned that Perla has got international investing. So how does that work? So obviously we're still paying brokerage on Perla, but how does it relate in terms of the brokerage fees and how does Perla international investing work? Yeah, so with the new pricing on our Aussie brokerage, we're going to make that consistent with US. So that's a little bit different to how some of the people in the market are doing it where there's no brokerage at all. But for us, again, going back to the ideas of simplicity and transparency and consistency, we just thought if there was one price and you knew whether you were buying or selling what you were going to pay, that would be helpful to people. And if not helpful, at least it would be easy to see. So we do also have the FX element and because we've charged brokerage fee, we've obviously made that as cheap as possible. So we're not really looking to make a huge amount of money on FX. That's a sort of business that is a pass-through. It's not really value add. Everyone can do it. And for us, we were much more interested in having just a balance that people could understand. So we put that through a, an institutional FX broker who charges us. 
And we pass most of that cost for us. And I think if we're going to go through some comparables, we're going to be at 650 or 550 if you prepay for a US share. And the FX on that for us is if we look at BIPs, which is what most of the people in the market present their pricing in, I think ours at the moment comes out at about 36, 37 BIPs and some of the other pricing in the market at 70, 70 BIPs and above. Wow. So that's basically half. It is, but it's not like for because you've yeah. got brokerage fee. And to boil it all down really simply, if you are going to buy and sell and buy and sell and buy and sell, it's obviously going to be better to be with one of the others. If you're going to accumulate more meaningful parcels and then go and buy, Perl, there's a clear mathematical point where Perl will be cheaper. And it's probably somewhere between two and three and a half grand, I think. And so the way we've thought about it is most of our investors are putting most of their money into the Australian market. So that's really simple. And then for US, what we're seeing is people are bolting on some companies that they really want to hold. And I think we all could probably guess the big companies that people want to hold forever, right? So the reason we structured ours in that way was we go, okay, people might optimize their Australian brokerage and invest in $1,000 parcels or $2,000 parcels and do that as regularly as they can. And they put that into some really simple ETFs. And that's what they're doing on our platform, right? Something like 70% of the volume is going into ETFs. And then all the while, they're also accumulating a parcel that they might want to go and buy. And I'm just going to use an as an example here, they might want to go and buy Amazon or Alphabet, right? Our idea was if they accumulate that money and they get that into a, a nice parcel, probably three, four, five grand, and they go, I'm not going to dollar cost average into Amazon, right? I'm just going to buy some and then maybe in a little while I'll buy some more, but I'm buying that chunk and I'm going to let it sit there forever or 10 years or whatever their time frame. So our thought was very simple. Give a one-off cost that was really simple and easy to understand not trying to make all our money on FX. And then the third part of this equation, which we haven't talked about, is ongoing costs. Now, there's no real ex expensive ongoing costs for a lot of the US brokerage accounts in Australia, but there are some. So if you look at all the T's and C's, you'll see a little sort of holding fees here and there potentially. I can't speak for all of them, but I know they exist. And they're not huge, right? They're not huge. I'm not saying this is a big money spinner, but because we're charging brokerage upfront, our idea was once we've charged you, we're not going to charge you again. So we don't have that third bucket of cost. So for someone who's got that parcel, wants to buy those shares and park it there forever, you've paid up front, it's done, and hopefully it's as simple as it can be. Simplicity is, is always good. Kiss principle. I love it. So Nick, you, as I found out, father of three. Now, I don't have any kids yet but hopefully one day. So I'm still trying to suss out what different options are available for investing for kids. And I've learned that, again, that's another thing that Perla has launched since I first did my research, and that's the Perla Minor Accounts. So what is a Perla Minor Account and how does it work? Yeah, this is actually, I forgot to mention, this was one of the things that we're actually working on V2 of this. So right now you can uh, open a, a minor account and buy chess sponsored shares and a lot of people have been doing this. We launched it in the background and then we were really surprised about how much people wanted to do it. It's really quite simple. The process of setting up the account is almost identical. In terms of paperwork, you need to upload a birth certificate. One of the areas, and this is maybe a little bit granular for this discussion, but I'll go there anyway, is thinking about the tax implications. So the government, and I think rightly, has put in place some protections to make sure people weren't investing huge amounts of money in their children's name just to create more tax-free thresholds for themselves. So one of the things we get asked most often is, should I put the investment in my child's tax file number or should I get a tax file number for my child or should I put it in my own? And that's an area where we're trying to come up with some sensible answers. I'm not going to offer any up here, except to say that you can change it along the way and that the ATO actually has some pretty clear guidance on when it's going to become more economic to have the tax file number in your child's name versus your name. So anyway, to come back to your question, there's not a lot to it, but what we are working on is something we think is pretty exciting. And that is a more standalone version of investing for kids. So what we've learned through this process is parents start out wanting to do it and it's not something necessarily their children interact with, but more and more we've seen teenage children trying to interact with, with their parents so what that's set us on the path to do is try and create 
almost an offshoot app and we don't know what we're going to call it yet but it's going to be Perla but it's going to be almost an offshoot app that the user experience is completely reimagined for a parent who's investing alongside their child right through to a youth investor who's later teenage years earning their own money and learning about this stuff for the first time. Really exciting. Hoping we can launch that in sometime in the next May, June type area. And if we look at what's happened in the market, there's a lot of investing for kids apps out there. And I would say this without being disparaging or trying to be, a lot of them really seem like investing app had a product and in a way just tried to do the bare minimum to put the word kids on top of it. And, and so there's some good products yeah. out there. Don't get me wrong, but that's what sort of inspired us to go, okay, no, let's not just have a tab in the website where it's the same thing, which is what we did originally. Let's really go deep in this and let's focus on why are parents doing this, how to make it easier to do it for multiple children. What are the kids saving for? Is it a gap year? Is it a car? Is it just the home deposit? Even if that's 15 years away, how do we make that engaging and how do you give that pathway for parents to start engaging with their children as those children grow? Anyway, very excited about it. Thanks for asking the question. It's cool. I can see Pearl is really expanding and providing more and more sort of learning resources and tools and calculators and everything. I even heard rumors about like a Perla forum. So what's going on with a Perla forum? Are we going to see that soon? And if so, what's it going to look like? Yeah, hopefully. I think it's gotten a bit of attention because... I think there's a lot of attention on this whole topic of social media and how people are sharing information about money, which we think is equally important and also important to get right. And despite always wanting to try and do the right thing, there are a lot of people out there who don't. We've all got to be held to the highest standards. You're right, we are working on something of a forum and hopefully it's going to come out soon. I think if we just start with looking at what exists today, so you've got typical forums some of them are investing focused and really like the old school idea of a stock investing forum and I think we all know what they look and feel like then you've got social media where sub communities have grown around investing this is everything from reddit to instagram all really on the whole in the areas that you know you and we play is it's positive it's helpful it's not pump and dump schemes or any of this other stuff that's the two ends of the spectrum right and in the middle when you really peel it all back there's so much more there's comments under youtube videos there's comments under blogs there's all these different weird little facets of people talking about money online and they're all disaggregated no one can track them there's probably financial advice being given somewhere So to bring it back to your question, we've been mostly focused on what exists today and can we in some small way be a positive contribution to that space, right? So we know that people want to ask questions and we know that there's a range of people from novices to people like yourself to advisors who want to try and be part of that conversation. Not to answer the questions necessarily directly as in you should do this, but just because we all live our lives in this, right? And so I can't give too much more away except to say we're going to try and address some of the kind of wildness to online discussion about money. We're going to try and make it transparent and we're also going to try and have a values system for verification and who become thought leaders in the forum linked back to who is most supported by the community but also who is actually licensed or who is from a product owner to bring transparency. So I guess that all sounds a bit fluffy, but think of a world where you've got representatives of ETFs and you've got representatives of financial advisors and you've got representatives of say Perla, you've got content creators, you've got just real people engaging and it's in a way that is more transparent and helpful and safer legally than anything exists on the internet. That's our kind of big mission. We don't know how to solve all of the problems yet, but we're certainly working on it. It does sound exciting. I know when I was, and I wouldn't go so far as to call myself an expert. Like I feel like I'm learning this as I go along. I am actually doing the financial advice, very basic course at the moment where I can learn the foundations. And I think as we're 
evolving and as we're getting more clarity from ASIC, the regulator, about what is and isn't appropriate for online discussions. It's good for a lot of people in the space to be educating themselves on exactly what the regulations are. And so one of those is that the RG146 compliance. And so it's a very basic course, but it just gives you a bit of an overview. More so like I found myself being very focused on ETFs and ways to minimize costs. But the RG course talks a bit more about finance holistically. So looking at some of the blind spots where I haven't really paid much attention to. But when I'm learning, I'm going out and I've used a lot of online resources. And yeah, it can be really tricky to sort out the fact from fiction, especially when you've got these kind of like new sort of murky areas like crypto and NFTs. It's really hard to know what's legitimate information. And so I think that would be good to see, especially if there's some kind of vetting process and transparency So it's not just like the Wild West of Reddit where people just say whatever they want with no fear of retribution. Yeah, and I think what you're doing, which I would say is good on you, probably have multiple choices as to the way your content can go. And the fact that you've already started doing that course shows that there are going to be people out there that out of all this attention the space is getting who are going to continue to try and do the right thing. And that's what any of us can do, right, is just try and stick to what we're doing Make sure we're looking at the future and going, are we going to be part of solving some of this or are we going to stick our heads in the sand? And hopefully none of us are going to be on the wrong side of it, right? But it's important to get right because social media is not going anywhere. People's demand for financial literacy is definitely not going anywhere. And I think we're going to come into this age of, we talk a lot about climate sustainability. I think financial sustainability is arguably just as important for people in the coming decades around being able to support yourself. And I think it's going to get harder. And so people like yourself creating content, we're hopefully trying to be a positive in that space as well. And all the other resources, the government resources as well. If we can all come together a little bit more on that stuff, I think we're all trying to do the right thing. And it can be stressful. It's been stressful for us to try and do the right thing and keep doing what we want to do. But all I can say is we're still trying. And hopefully as we grow and continue to grow with people's support, we figure out some of this stuff. I think it comes down to like at your core, what are your values and principles? And I guess from day one, chatting to yourself and Kurt, I got the vibe of Perlas not to make cash. And obviously your business needs to be profitable, but the culture of the company and the ethos is all around financial independence. What is it? Are we without chronic stress? Something like that? Chronic financial stress? We've tried to articulate it many times along the way. I think the interesting thing is, that if you look at pretty much any other industry, right, there's some value for money equation. And whether it's consumer or insurance, health, etc., there's this idea that I'm getting good value for money. And in a way, finance companies and the culture around big finance say, and I'm not saying this like that they're the evil infrastructure of the world and we should all be anti-establishment. I'm saying in a weird way, big finance and certain companies have been able to grow and thrive despite not necessarily being held accountable for what is value for money for the services they provide. So Perler is a business we want to grow and we can't help a lot of people if we're not a sustainable business. But our mentality is much more of we need to provide value, it needs to be transparent, and people need to make the decision for themselves as to whether they want to do a business with us or not. So I think the age of big finance companies existing despite screwing people over is hopefully into its last stages. I'm sure there will be more scandals to come in the world. We're not a not-for-profit, we're a business, but we just believe that if you create good products that are valuable to people, they buy them off you, just like any other business, you should be able to grow and be successful and do good stuff. It's shocking, isn't it? Speaking of just insurance, like it seems to be the only business I'm aware of in the world where you actually get penalized for loyalty where sort of your premiums go up each year, whereas if you switch, you get a discount usually. It's crazy. (laughs) Yeah, and like you were talking about super before, it's slightly different, but I consolidated my super years and years ago and I was really happy when I did that. But I know that I haven't done the same with my insurance, so you can't get it all right. Just got to keep turning up and (laughs) bit by bit fix our finances. (laughs) If you're ready to level up your investing, then studies show that automation and removing human error is going to be the key to your long-term success. That's why I switched to automated investing through Perla using the Perla Auto Invest feature. Perla provides some of Australia's lowest brokerage costs and many ETFs are even brokerage free through them, which keeps more money in your pocket. 
Perla are chess sponsored through the ASX, which means your investments are securely held against your individual HIN, and there is no doubt as to the safety and security of your investments. Perla have a host of tools and features to help you reach financial independence quicker, and you can even follow me and see all of my investments through your Perla login. You can read all about Perla from my comprehensive review at www.captainfire.com forward slash Perla dash review. And for an exclusive invite code and free trade, use sign up code CAPTAINFIRE. It's been awesome to chat about Perla. And, uh, and I know you're a busy man these days, Nick, but I would love to ask a couple of quick questions, if I may, about just your personal experience with money. Sure, go for it. And now, I don't know, I may have to rethink these segments, but I guess the first one, is there anything you wish you knew before you began your career? I think my biggest regret is that for probably the first five to 10 years of my career, when I was earning way more money than I am now, I definitely had a mentality of enjoy it and not worry too much about saving because you'll always earn more money. And that mentality cost me a lot of money, I think, over the years. Sure, I had fun, but if I'd just been slightly more disciplined, I would have been able to have probably just as much fun and have really made the most of those high income earning years where I didn't have dependents and whatnot. So working on that work-life balance and I guess that now versus later delayed gratification and investing. I guess that leads perfectly into my next question, which is how has your personal investing preferences changed and how do you invest these days? Yes. So aside from the fact that most of my mega net wealth is tied up in Perla now, so investing is largely something of my day job in that I'm trying to grow my own business. But I've probably gone on quite a typical for some people, but some people I imagine listening to this podcast will be like shocked by this. When I first started my career, my intro to investing was definitely the stock tip from a mate. Put some of my money that I didn't really value for the reasons I mentioned earlier into some crappy stock that I knew nothing about and then watch the screen whilst I'm supposed to be working. This is how I started, right? So terrible. But I'm not alone in that, so I can say it and go, well, that was me and I'm not proud of it, but that was me. And I don't even remember the first company I bought is what I would say. So I'm sure I could go and figure it out. It was with Comsec, but that was the start of my investing journey. And after a little while of stuffing around with things like that, I gave up on that completely. So I sort of went through this process of I would do it and then I would go, this is a waste of my time and money. I'm going to stop. I'm just going to earn money and have a good time. And then I got a little bit more patient in that process and I started putting a little bit of money into companies that I understood and believed in. And I'm not talking about doing fundamental research. I was no Warren Buffett disciple or anything like that. I bought a dairy company because my housemate's girlfriend was lactose intolerant and she really liked this milk and it was a small company on the stock exchange at that point. And I was like, oh, people love this. It's good for them. I'm going to buy that company. Went really well, right? But I then sold the shares to fund a holiday, which I don't regret it was a good holiday, but the shares went up like 10 or 15 times more after that. A finance person, I clearly, it's still in my mind. I still think about those shares I sold and how much they would have been worth. So I guess that's a story in two parts. One, it started off basically gambling. Second, it was, okay, invest in things you understand, but don't invest unless you can keep the money there for long term. So that's my little life story of investing. And now today, obviously, we've built a business around passively investing in ETFs and My personal experience is a huge factor in how we came to focus on that because I look back on my first 10 years and I go, wow, if I knew this stuff today and I had these principles and I had this supportive community around me, I could be in a vastly different position. Now, I've done okay. It's not that I wasted all my money, but if I had the idea of financial independence in my 20s and I had the idea of passive investing and ETFs in my 20s, we all know what the stock market's done in the last 15 years, right? It's a pretty powerful story, and I don't think yours is too dissimilar from many people. I certainly started my investing journey stock picking as well and just going off recommendations from other people. And yeah, it, it didn't work out as good for me as passive investing has. So you talked a bit about your investing journey, your mindset and knowledge changing. What are some of the biggest positive influences that have been on you experiences or books or courses that kind of stuff I think for me in a weird way it's been not academic elements like books or courses I think it's been my life's changing right I can't probably point to a book I read or something that gave me that aha moment but I can certainly say probably even buying a dog was the start of a process of going okay I need to get more on top of this whole life and money element. And then obviously bought one dog, bought two dogs, which we've both still got, and having kids. That evolution over the last 10 years 
has been what's driven my current kind of focus on finance frugality, I think, and not frugality from a deprive myself of things and my wife's the same, but frugality from a, is this the best thing we can do with this money? And does this, sorry to use the term, does this bring us joy? Is this important to us? That's a bit of a waffly answer. I can't recommend a book or something, but I can say that for us, it was staying in tune with the fact that our lives were changing. And that for me is what really gave me that catalyst to do better and think better. I love it. So basically, as you got older, you had more responsibilities and you realized you had to be mindful about how you were going to allocate your resources and time. Yeah. And I think the thing I'm grateful for is that I didn't look back in my mid-30s. I'm mid-30s now, right? I didn't get to my mid-30s and look back and go, oh gosh, I've got this family unit now and I have no idea how to make it sustainable together with my wife, we evolved our practices along the way. So I think we've come along and we feel quite good about where we're at in terms of our spending and our budgeting and investing, obviously, but it's been a process of evolution rather than an epiphany at some point. Like a natural progression. I feel similar in that I don't think I've really had any crazy light bulb moments. There were a few awesome books that I read that put me on the right path, but I felt like it's been an iterative thing. So every time I will go back to those books or go try and go back to the basics, I feel like I'll pick up extra tips and stuff as I go along, which is good. Nick, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. Now, I just want to finish. It's a bit of a cruel question, but I love finishing on this one. I know we've talked a lot about them throughout the episode today, but if you could distill tips for financial independence or tips for someone who wants to reach financial independence down into your top three, what would they be? So what are your top three tips if you want to get ahead? really isolate where you're, I'll use the term wasting money. It's not the right word, but where you're wasting money. And my definition of wasting money is spending frivolously on stuff that you could take or leave. So cut out those things that aren't really sustaining you, aren't changing your life, and also don't even bring you that much joy, right? And be left with your version of what's essential. And that's going to be different for everybody. I think once you do that, I'm not someone to focus on hard and fast budgeting and saving rules. But once you really focus on what's important to you, it becomes a lot easier. Second thing, obviously, is I think probably the most important thing and one thing I focused on is enjoy your job and do it really well. I'm not one who's ever had too many side hustles. When I was at uni, I had little businesses and things, but I've always just focused on my job and tried to do the best I can to make sure I get that promotion, get that bonus, etc. And I think that sort of dovetails into kind of why Perla exists, but also the third one, right? So if you can focus on your job and focus on the top line, right, and you're not wasting money, then what's left over is your ability to enjoy your time. So I actually think the tips for financial independence, my third one is not one around how to get to financial independence, but it's actually how to live your life with a degree of independence as you're getting there. So I think the third one's more of a mentality thing. Make sure at all stages you're doing parts of being sensible, you're doing parts of hard work, and then the third element is you're enjoying it. Because for me, at least, I'm not someone who can give up five years of my life now and basically have no life for 10 or 15 years of more freedom in the future. I want to enjoy my time now and enjoy my time in the future And I just want that to be on a really sustainable spectrum. I've never had to answer that question before. And hopefully that's helpful. No, that's great, man. I think like sustainability, I think is the key because I know that me personally, I've been really guilty of taking it way too far and like literally living off beans and $30 worth of groceries and not spending any money just so that I can invest as much money as possible. And I found probably a more sustainable work-life balance and you know, you don't need to have a savings rate right up there in the 80s. You can still have quite a meaningful impact to financial independence, even like in the 50s and below. So it's about finding the balance that's right for you and your life. And finding the free things to enjoy. Oh, yeah. There's so much free stuff. Hey, like surfing, once you grab a board, it's pretty low cost activity. Yes. Luckily, I don't have this issue, but I, you can go into a vortex, whether it's surfing or cycling or bouldering or whatever it is you want to do but yeah finding those things that you can enjoy and sustain I think is is so important otherwise what are we all doing it for I can relate to the vortex I've definitely been sucked into the aviation vortex I've spent more money than I would ever like to admit um in this conversation (laughs) 
I actually recall you mentioning something to me once about your essential oils vortex as well. Do you want to talk about that? Okay, yeah. So I have spent thousands of dollars on oils that were recommended to me by my flying instructor because I was having some troubles with sleeping, so I'd be so worked up from flights. And I was told, these things will calm you down. I'd spent thousands of dollars on lavender oil and stuff. So don't do that, guys. That's my tip. Don't buy multi-level marketing oils. They will not improve your life, but they will make your apartment smell nice. They do smell Um, nice. They do help you drift off to sleep, but I think that comes down to science regarding memory triggers. So if you associate lavender with sleep, it's going to help you get into your sleep routine. But I don't believe the mumbo jumbo that there's some magical chemical inside the lavender oil that helps you sleep anyway i think that's part of the whole figure out what you need to get through but we've got those oils lying around from home and i do pop them in the dispenser thing from time to time and it does smell good and i enjoy the smell there's no right or wrong way what is it take time to stop and smell the diffuser (laughs) (laughs) oh geez all right mate we just hit the magical time i know you have to go so thanks again for making time this morning i know you're a very busy man it's been awesome to hear an update on perla and what we've got in the near future coming out as well. And it's been great to unpack a little bit about your financial journey as well. Just before we go, where can people get in touch with you or learn more about Perla? Well, hopefully everything is from perla.com. A way that we like to engage with people is through our socials as well. And the team are fairly active on that. So you're not really getting some sort of agency-led approach there. So Perla HQ was a great way to get to know a little bit about us. It's a bit raw, it's a bit fined, but between perla.com and Perla HQ, you should know everything you need to know about Perla and try and figure out whether you like us or not. Awesome. So for everyone listening, I'll have the show notes on the blog as well. So just if you scroll down, there'll be obviously links to everything we've spoken about today and the Perla website, as well as a transcript. If you want to brush up and don't particularly like listening to a whole nother hour again. Again, thanks so much for your time, Nick. It's been awesome. I hope you have a wonderful day, mate, and get to enjoy some time with your kids. Thanks, mate. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Captain Fi Financial Independence Podcast. To read the transcripts or check out the show notes, head over to www.captainfi.com for all the details. If you have a question for the captain, make sure to get in touch. You might even make it on the airwaves. You can reach me online through the Captain Fi contact form or get in touch through the socials. I'm active on Facebook and Instagram, as well as a number of online finance and investing forums. And finally, remember, the information presented on the show and the links provided are for general information purposes only. They should not be taken as constituting professional financial advice. You should always do your own research when making any financial decisions and make sure it's appropriate for your personal circumstance. 